Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for February 24th, 2020. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Fabric with Anita Nikolic. Uh, Fabric is the Adaptive Programmable Networked Research Infrastructure for Computer Science. And Anita is a research professor in computer science at Illinois Tech and serves as the co-director of Fabric. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. And um, we will accept questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand things over to Anita. Anita, welcome. Thank you, and thanks, thanks everybody for joining on a, on a Monday morning. Okay, um, is my screen okay? Can you guys see it? Yep, we could see it. Okay. Well, again, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, what is Fabric. Uh, Fabric is a new NSF award. So I'm Anita Nikolic. My background is in networking and security, not necessarily in test beds. I was not a, um, excuse me, it's not a Genie user and not a big test bed user. So some of this is new to me. So Fabric uh, was funded by NSF's MidScale program. MidScale is one of NSF's uh, 10 big ideas. The 10 big ideas also encompass things like uh, quantum computing and the future of work. Um, so those are really interesting. If you haven't heard of them or you're not familiar with them, it's, it's worth checking out. So Fabric was awarded and it started October 1st for four years of construction. So some of what I am talking about is still being figured out. The award itself is for the construction of the test bed. And I'll keep mentioning that kind of throughout just to keep us on track. Um, so MidScale is a program that's somewhere between 20 million and 70 million. So it's kind of like somewhere between a computer cluster and a telescope. We were very happy to compete against science MidScale projects like telescopes and things like that. Um, and to be able to get funded to provide a computer science test bed, a computer science instrument. So it's important to keep this in mind. This isn't just a network test bed or security test bed, but a computer science test bed. And again, the four year grant is for construction purposes only, but we do expect early operations in about two years. So these are some of the leadership team for Fabric. There's some familiar faces here. Many of you know uh, these folks. It's, it's been very nice to have a combination of backgrounds, people who do research operations, industry, government, to give us various perspectives. But we need your help and input, particularly for security use cases. So why Fabric? What's, what's our story? So the grand challenge we wrote about in our proposal that we presented to NSF was there still exists this need to create the next generation of internet. It sounds really corny, but if you're in operations or in security, likely you understand how frustrating running, patching, and trying to secure an aging internet can be. And many of us are frustrated. If you're a researcher in areas other than networking, this kind of test bed is really exciting because it encompasses things other than just network protocols. Really, the, the, the drivers here span computer science. So what's changed? We all know that compute and storage has become very cheap in the past 10 to 20 years. It can be put directly in the network. There's a lot more emerging methods of programmability for the network. And I think all of us are hearing about advances in machine learning and AI for not just for networking, but for other purposes like um, discovering malware and things like that. So there's this opportunity right now for the community to push these boundaries. Although the main challenge is how to revise the core of the network, we're thinking about machine learning and AI and how this is, you know, the, the network is like a big data instrument which produces data that can be used for research and for operations. So fabric for everyone, what does this mean? So for us, peering operational and experimental networks is really important. So as I talk today, we intend to connect, this is kind of one of our pervasive themes, we intend to connect to resources such as Cloud Lab and PeeringDB as well as the internet. We don't want to recreate 
test infrastructure. We want to rather leverage existing test infrastructure to make a large footprint available to researchers and to operators. So although our grand challenge is to enable the, you know, a new internet in a better way of carrying science traffic, that was another big message of ours. Our science drivers, as we call them, were cybersecurity, IoT and wireless, machine learning and AI. And one of our other big drivers is to help train and educate students. So we want to create this diverse environment which combines a programmable core and edge networks, a lot of computational resources, 5G and IoT capabilities. So while we enable novel approaches to distributed and network systems control and management, um, we also want to be mindful that as we do build a new generation of internet, security must be an inherent part of the design. So the fabric network will, for the most part, be a physical network infrastructure. So we'll eventually get to security use cases. I want to give you an idea of what it's going to look like. So it's going to be a physical network infrastructure consisting of physical fabric nodes and racks interconnected by dedicated backbone wavelengths between the core nodes. And we'll go through what all these are. So we're going to have a mixture of dedicated waves and layer two VLANs connecting the edge nodes. Because fabric nodes consist of um, high speed switching, processing and storage, they're capable of not only forwarding packets, but processing at line rates, uh, being able to do inspection, being able to do other things other than just pass through the data. So you look at the, we'll start with the blue, the nine blue nodes. These nodes are located in co-location facilities available to ESNet. So ESNet is a big partner on Fabric because ESNet is designing their ESNet 6, their next generation network. So we're able to leverage their co-location facilities um, and some of the other blue ones are in regional providers. So the blue links, the little lines between the blue nodes, they are dedicated optical 100 gig links. The yellow, there's, you can see there's far fewer of them, the yellow indicates a one terabit capacity super core. So for inter-node connections, these super core nodes will support terabit capacity using DWDM equipment that the Fabric project is purchasing. Regular core nodes are gonna use 100 gig wavelengths using the ESNet optical infrastructure that many of you are probably familiar with. The little stars on here, you see a bunch of little stars, those are um, boxes, the, the name boxes where you see Internet 2 and AWS, um, that's where we'll be peering with public cloud facilities. Um, and the stars are for different nodes that we're putting out there. So the fabric, so the physical network infrastructure is connecting with these cloud-based virtual endpoints um, from Internet 2, through their Cloud Connect service, um, through Azure, uh, uh, Google to allow the virtual networks, virtual machines and application stacks in these cloud providers to peer virtually with Fabric. So we're able to form this hybrid system, you know, to support say machine learning or different tasks where we're going from uh, commercial cloud to R&E networks and to existing test beds. We're going to be locating additional core nodes in several regional networks. So the edge nodes, which are not up here, we'll, we'll, you'll see them on the next uh, slide. The edge nodes, they're going to support connections to what we're calling deep edge nodes, where the researchers and operators work. So campuses, um, physical or virtual machines that'll connect directly to researcher or operator end systems. Um, they have, you know, may have, these end systems, as you know, often have reduced performance and would traverse virtualized links, but we will still support Fabrics node architecture. So going on to the next one, the edge, we've got a bunch of different, it's gonna take me a bunch of clicks here because we, we have a bunch of partners. I think that's it. A bunch of partners. So the edge nodes, which you can see up here, all these are edge of some sort. These will have dedicated connectivity to the core. So some of these are experiments like powder, some of them are regionals, some of them are supercomputers. So we combine these, this multi-resource, you know, network, compute, storage, all these types of resources, programmability of fabric nodes with dedicated network connections and allow for users to have a degree of control, repeatability, and data collection that's not currently available. So the co-location of our nodes, our fabric nodes with universities, science DMZs, um, places like TAC, supercomputing centers, regionals, and other R&E cyber infrastructure allows us to engage with local researchers on your campuses and CI professionals and operators. 
so that the, the resources for fabric ideally are tailored to individual community and resource-based interests and capabilities. So we're really hoping to span from operators to researchers and scientists and try to satisfy everybody's needs for advanced testing. So these connections to, um, we're expecting interoperability with places like Genie, Cloud Lab, Chameleon, um, these things you see listed, to enable the resources on the ends to be logically viewed as additional edge nodes in Fabric. One really interesting one I think for security is, I don't know if it's up here, I think Columbia might be, yeah, you see Columbia, but what's interesting is uh, if you're not familiar with it, there's a test that's called Peering DB, and that connects via BGP with real networks at universities and, and internet exchange points. So instead of being observers on the internet, um, if you're a researcher, you essentially become a participant and you can run experiments on the real network. So that's existed for a few years and Peering DB is one of our uh, places we'll be connecting with. I, I think that's very exciting for um, any kind of security experimentation involving BGP type resources. So what is a fabric node? Um, these are called Hank nodes. I did not come up with the name and if you're wondering what a Hank is, it is in the upper right. A Hank in the fabric vernacular is um, similar to a coiled or wrapped unit of yarn. I took this straight off of Google. But the Hank nodes, edge nodes, are more like on-prem routers. So if, if we kind of go through the, the semantics, a core node directly connects to ESnet 6 DWDM waves, and there's nine of these planned. An edge node connects directly to a core node, and it could be via DWDM, layer two, or another method. And a facility is, as, as, as self-explanatory, a facility which connects to a fabric node. So an edge node that connects uh, to a core node via DWDM or optical may be referred to as an edge core node. So the core of each node is a high performance switch that interconnects the different elements of the node. And we're still figuring out what exactly the node vendor is going to be, what type of um, compute, you know, whether it's GPUs, how much, how much processing. That's, we're, we're kind of still figuring that out for the next month. But basically, the node will have high performance servers, GPUs, RAM, and some solid state disk drives. And we'll have some specialized cards to provide, um, to be able to program network flow behaviors using things like P4 and OpenFlow. So if there's opinions, I mean, if you, if you have strong opinions on things like GPU, FPGA usefulness for compute at the edge, for things like People are using machine learning for inferencing, for security events, malware detection, or in the network for network acceleration or time sync. We would definitely appreciate any input to that. So measurement capabilities. We have a team, a sub team that is developing a measurement framework for collecting and storing data from inside various experiments or topologies. So the nodes, in addition to all the stuff I just mentioned, the nodes will include significant measurement capabilities for basic things like um, measuring resource utilization, power consumption, network performance um, at, at high fidelity and supported by the, the framework. The measurement data, I think one of the key things, again, that touches on security, so measurement data will be collected, processed, and stored. And experimenters will have access to some disk space, and I'm hoping people will have access to some of the measurement data to do some interesting things. We're enabling something called the second bullet packet GPS. This is part of uh, ESnet's high touch services. And this is where we aim to do this real time precision telemetry, real time uh, stamping uh, down to nanosecond level. So part of why they need it and part of why security researchers need this is for real time traffic profiling and detailed insights into network. And I think for our community, for security, doing things like situational awareness in real time, you need to have packet time stamping. So that's pretty exciting, this, this measurement capability. And if there are some we haven't thought of that is useful for your research or your work in ops, we are all ears. So I'm gonna go through what Fabric is and is not. Um, it's an everywhere programmable network meaning instead of having a dumb core and smart edges, the whole network can be programmed to be smart, ideally for IoT devices and things like that. We're hoping people experiment on new internet architectures, protocols, there's people doing 
named data networking, people doing different types of experimental architectures. We, we hope TCP IP is replaced some, sometime by the end of my lifetime at least, and this is a place to experiment with those protocols and distributed applications. Fabric's extensible, that's really important in order to connect to new facilities like cloud networking and other test beds. And eventually we will have a bring your own equipment uh, option to either put things in our core or your own equipment to be in line. We're still figuring out how that'll work, but keep that in the back of your mind that we do want to include um, test, testing equipment of your own. So what Fabric is not, um, it's not an isolated test bed. It's gonna appear, again, I can't stress how important that is. It's not one of these test beds that you program and, and nobody knows what it is. We fully are gonna appear at layer two and layer three with a variety of networks. It is not intended for long-term production workloads. So this can be a little confusing, particularly for the science workflows. We want to enable people to optimize their science transfers, their science projects, but not to use this as a live network to conduct the science. So that's kind of a fine line, um, but it's not intended because we are not providing guarantees that this is going to be, um, you know, five nines for your science experimentation. We also want to be mindful of the data. I'll talk about that more. Um, we don't want, you know, PII on here. And it's not just supposed to be used. We've asked people, you have had people ask, can we use it for transport just between networks? No, it's, it's not really for transport, it's for experimentation. So here's our science design, initial science design driver teams. Again, um, we split these up into four initial drivers, security, machine learning, IoT, and NDN, or memes data networking. And here are the associated people and institutions. And all this means is that they helped us shape these use cases. So uh, Phil Porras has a pretty broad view of security. Uh, Malafi uh, has a pretty broad view of machine learning. Russ Clark at Georgia Tech and IoT and Alex at NDN. So these teams are really just helping us formulate the initial design requirements and validate kind of just what we were thinking was correct. But there are many more uses. Um, these are just kind of the four, the four initial ones. So let's get into some security, uh, potential security use cases. And this is not to limit people. These are things that, you know, we're kind of mulling over. Because we will connect to the real internet and figure out what that means in terms of the connectivity, a wider array of experiments are possible. So one of the things that I know in, in past lives people have tried to do is to really do things like observe botnet behavior at scale and the command and control channels. This is really hard to do. Test beds generally aren't great to do this and definitely you can't allow it to go on to the raw internet and just take over. But figuring out reasonable ways at scale to observe botnet behavior in a somewhere between completely isolated controlled environment in the wild west of the internet is something we'd like people to do. Observing malware spread and detection. Um, being able to do intrusion detection at scale across the WAN. I mean, ideally, we would love to have improved situational awareness via some of the machine learning techniques by observing malicious activity faster being able to use machine learning algorithms to detect this and stop attacks before they get started. Um, recently, there was a, a, a security company that helped um, a casino when its algorithms detected an exfiltration by a connected fish tank. And this is by observing the whole network. So we, we hope that we're able to enhance human abilities to detect events or people running, however large your, your SOC or your maybe one security person abilities might be. We want to be able to enhance the capabilities of a seam by helping you find needles in a haystack, you know, by filtering data passed to the human analyst so that there's not so many false positives. I mean, there's so many false positives today. We are hoping that there is some research available at scale to really be able to hone machine learning techniques to eliminate false positives and help operators. Operational testing, and again, these are just things that, you know, we're just throwing out there. Being able to, for operators, test and observe exploits at scale. Being able to set up a honeypot, allow people to do, you know, um, perform things like web app vulnerability experimentation by injecting exploits and monitoring the success. Be able to see how, how malware spreads at, for your scale. 
things like our PKI deployment, which is, you know, can be a little tricky if you don't have access to a lot of equipment, being able to test how that might look in your environment, testing firewall configs. Is your firewall config, is that going to be successful against a DDoS attack? You know, potentially using this test bit to generate a lot of traffic and, and test your configs. So some of the, some of the challenges to, to even doing this kind of testing is often the barriers to entry for these test beds can be pretty high especially if you're one of two or three people on a security team, um, this can be pretty daunting. So one of our challenges is to lower the barrier to entry to make this more approachable so people find it useful. We wanna make sure there are common tool sets. You don't have you know, a log into a test bed and sit there wondering what the heck to do. Um, this will take some time and it'll take some use cases to show what you, the community are interested in. And by the way, I just put an FYI here. This is a really, if you, if you are interested in some of these machine learning techniques specifically geared for InfoSec and operators and finding situational awareness, there's a conference called CAMLIS, which is every October in DC. And I found that quite useful to talk about kind of real world applications. So another security challenge is data. So obviously to do good security research, we need high fidelity data sets. So accessibility to these is often very hard. There was a, a paper a couple of years ago from University of Tulsa that showed that only 20% of data sets created by researchers are publicly shared. And this is something we hear all the time is just getting access to research data sets. This is something that we have a data subgroup that we both need help with and would like to change is to be able to share and reuse research data sets in general, not just for security, but in general. We need things like better, better archiving. We need policies that, you know, range from really restrictive, if you're going to release that botnet in the wild, we may want to restrict where it goes, to very permissive. Grappling with this question of PII, um, this community understands better that PII can be rather nuanced in that for example, our IP address is PII. There's no federal guidelines about this, except for uh, COPA, which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So this range of what, you know, if people will allow others to collect data about their network, um, this requires further discussion. It's not just gonna be a black and white, no, you can't do it, it's PII. This is something that we feel we can tackle to make a, a better test bed. And the opportunity to have ground truths that, that you do some collection and then experiment against it is, is very powerful. And I put that in quotes because this is ground truth. It still is in a test bed, but it's you can do some measurement against um, ground truth. So user education training. Um, if you follow CIS controls or other controls, CIS in particular asks specifically for um, I think it's control 20. They do ask for people to do pen testing. I can imagine using Fabric for some form of pen testing, whether it's setting up um, something similar to your environment doing pen testing, maybe creating a test bed that mimics production for specific pen tests, being able to do for, for you know, whether it's your institution or multiple institutions getting, getting folks together to do red team attacks against elements that are not typically tested in production, you know, such as attacks against, um, you know, some, some control systems. But I can imagine establishing a program for pen testing to do, you know, this full scope of attacks you may not be able to do on your campus against wireless and client-based and web applications. Um, so that, that could be interesting to build a small cyber range if you don't have access to one of the larger ones. We do want to partner with um, other experimentation efforts. If you haven't looked, I think I put the link in the next slide, the cybersecurity experimentation of the future that was a project funded in 2014, and they did it again in 2018. They have a website where they have done a really good job of surveying at least part of the community to say what kind of cybersecurity exp experimentation is needed. And they have some very specific requirements. So we are um, inspired by them and, and going to take um, some cues from what their recommendations are. These other two, LASER and CSET, are these um, more academic kind of workshops on security testing. We want to break ground and make sure that we're being inclusive for researchers who may not use a test bed like Fabric. 
the other, the little devil icon and the AppSec icon, those are DEF CON villages that are all about red teaming and apps, app security. And they often have some very interesting ideas about experimentation. So we do have some things that are on our wish list, or at least my wish list um, of security test beds. Again, this is um, fairly far in the future because uh, you know, we, we are funded to do an initial construction grant. So our wish list, which may not come to reality, are to connect to some of these test beds that are doing a fairly good job. Uh, the, um, the Virginia Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, they have this new 5G testing platform. Um, cyber Range uh, run by GRW has a pretty nice Cyber Range used for community college students with some good exercises set up. Of course, Michigan Cyber Range uh, has, some, has some great stuff. NIST has some test beds. So we're keeping our wish list open of folks we can partner with and figure out what is useful for the future. Probably not for at least another two years though. So again, we were, we were inspired by Ceph, which um, created this uh, community of testbed providers and experimenters who have thought through many of these questions. And they have looked at some architectures and infrastructure. And one of the folks who led this, uh, Terry Benzel, she is on our advisory committee to kind of guide us towards, so we don't duplicate what people have uh, done before. And one of their mantras is, you know, providing tools and methodologies. How do we ensure we do that? Um, for the whole life cycle of an experiment to, to enable sharing and reuse, repeatability, validity checking, et cetera, et cetera. So going back to the fabric construction timeline, right now we are still solidifying the final architecture, doing software development, refining requirements, community building. We have a workshop, I'll put up the slide. We have a workshop in April we're a little thin on security people. We would love to have some people attend that workshop in Chicago to really give us feedback for what we're missing. So right now we're planning, we're prototyping, doing software development about control frameworks, and we will begin deployment um, year two, which, which is October. So that means we, have, we will by then have fully defined what the nodes look like, do some testing, um, do some onboarding with the design drivers and get it ready for actual users. Year three, We'll continue to do that and by the end of year three we will start to have some initial experiments on there. Year four is really preparing for full bore operations. So just if you're interested just some people are interested in locations and types. Um, the tentative phase one deployments for the core nodes are here Chicago, DC, Salt Lake, and Dallas with 12 additional nodes which are a combination of these sites. I think the first core node is likely Starlight in, in Chicago. So we're looking to build a vibrant community of stakeholders. Um, we want to have people interested in using Fabric, people who were not just, you know, Genie or former testbed users, so people who maybe have never used a test, or maybe you hate test beds, maybe you think they're completely not useful. Um, tell us why. T tell me why it doesn't satisfy your needs and let us figure out how we can build a testbed to be better. We want regional partners, national partners. We're looking at international uh, partners, um, government agencies like DHS and NIST that um, focus on research but don't have the means to build a bunch of test beds. They may have small ones. How can we connect with them? And of course, industry who wants to test our partner. So we're going to be having these community events and workshops to not only share our vision and progress, but really to get feedback. We want to listen to you. Our community visioning workshop. Uh, which is on our website, whatisfabric.net. This is April 15th, 16th at UIC in Chicago. We're going to have people spanning the breadth of topic areas, IoT, um, networking, security, because we really want every group represented so we're not just listening to kind of the same old story. So please, if you're interested, please apply. You need to send in a, a short like, paper. So how do I get involved in Fabric? Um, our website, um, has a document on there that's been updated in the past couple of weeks. If I spoke too fast or you didn't catch half of this, there are slides up there that go into a little more detail on the architecture. This is, it's a lot to kind of absorb in half an hour. But you can look at that. Um, you can discuss if you want to connect your facility, your network, experiment with something that we haven't thought about. If you want to contribute a node on the campus or facility. Um, if you have researchers or, or you yourself would like to use it, please tell us. We have an opt-in on our site. We send mailings 
maybe once every six weeks, so it's pretty lightweight, but it's a good way to, to hear about what we're doing. And if you have ideas, comments, complaints, um, please email me. And that's, that's our slides. I know that's a lot of room for questions, so um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question here. Uh, when will the April 15th and 16th workshop acceptance notification be announced? Uh, we are going to announce the, the first round ones, the 29th. Is that, is that Friday? Uh, the 20, 28th or 29th for the first round. And then we're going to see if there's some areas that were not covered and we will uh, offer up a second round of people. Okay, thank you. And uh, we've got a question here. Uh, this workshop 2020 uh, web link says the workshop applications are due February 14th. Are we too late to participate? We, we kept it open for just the reason that this, because of this webinar, because you wanted to make sure that we left it open for people. Great. Thank you. Thank you and for it's doing that. The, it's, we say white paper, but it's pretty lightweight. We just want a few paragraphs as to why you want to come. Great. Uh, here's another question coming in. Uh, what do you think of cybersecurity in the context of large-scale parallel systems? Cybersecurity in the case, um, I might have to defer to my co-PI Ilios on the line. I'm not really a systems person, so I'm not sure what the question means. Um, maybe a, a little more uh, context for that question. Um, well, well, I guess we'll let this person uh, respond. Um, and while people are typing, um, I'll just kind of grab the screen back just so okay. we can go over a couple of other, uh, other, uh, should I stop this here? Yeah, no, that's okay. I can, I can okay. do it from here. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about things, uh, related to trusted CI while we're letting people type in questions. Uh, first, um, thank you all for coming to this presentation. And uh, if you have the opportunity, uh, please take our survey. I'm just grabbing the link right now so I could throw it in the chat. Uh, please take our survey and uh, let us know what you think about this presentation. Um, we also accept uh, suggestions for other speakers. And so we like, uh, We'd like you to fill out the comments and let us know if, if you have any other topics or uh, recommended uh, speakers to present. And then um, we've got a couple save the dates coming up. Uh, the Educause Security Professionals Conference is coming up in April in Bellevue, Washington. Registration is open. Um, I haven't gone back to check to see if they closed it yet, but uh, I believe it's, it's still open. And then PERC uh, 20 is coming out in uh, is coming up in July, and that's going to be in Portland, Oregon. The, the CFPs, I apologize, the, the CFPs, I think, are closed, and they are announcing uh, the selections, actually, as we speak, because some of my colleagues received uh, responses to their applications. And then we've got the Trusted CI uh, NSF Summit coming up in September uh, 22nd to 24th in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, we've got a little bit more um, explanation of that question earlier, Anita. Uh, this okay. person saying, um, oh, here we go. regarding, on. yeah, I'll just, I'll just read it out loud. Uh, regarding sure. large scale parallel systems, for example, do you consider threats like process node failure issues to HPC systems? So, yes, yeah, so that's an interesting question, especially as people talk about, um, there was a conference a few years ago where people talked about um, threats to exascale. What does that mean? So it, may, it might not be just on the nodes, it might be all the surrounding kind of holistic systems. So fabric, fabric itself and the scale, because it's not a lot of compute, doesn't lend itself to that in particular experimentation. However, we are connecting several HPC facilities. And I think when you look at failures in large systems, distributed systems, and potentially security threats to those systems, um, in context, yes, but I guess to directly answer your question, looking at a node failure in an HP system is a little bit outside the scope of this in particular. Um, yeah, we got a follow, uh, sorry, we've got a, another question here. 
One challenge for any test bed is balancing the non-production nature of the test bed against the opportunity for users with production workloads to participate. How will you engage users who have network needs to have their applications run in the test bed? Does this mean um, production? So yeah, I understand that you're balancing non-production, allowing people to do anything they want to keep it separated from, from hurting the test bed and production. So we say you, how we engage users um, who have network needs to have their applications run in the test bed. So does, does this mean production applications? Because there's kind of this fine line between long-term experiments and production. So basically we are, we are going to try to, you know, segment different experimenters experiments from each other so they don't harm them. But how will you engage users who have network needs to have their applications run in the test bed? Um, some a, a little follow-up clarification would be appreciated because I feel like I'm not answering the question properly. Okay, uh, we'll let that person uh, have a, a moment to respond. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, is, thank you, Jim, for the clarification uh, for PERC. Uh, the poster panel, uh, Birds of a Feather, and visualization submissions are still open. Uh, so if you want, are interested in submitting, just uh, go to their website for that. Uh, we've got a question here. An earlier slide deck had a backup slide with the detail of the proposed fabric edge node, the Hank. Is there an updated slide of that as well as an equivalent diagram of, core, of a core node? Such a good question. Um, we are aiming to get the updated Hank node and the core node to get that finalized. We are doing the final kind of bake off. We aim to get that final in about two weeks. And we're gonna put it on our website. There's a slide deck under, it's kind of hard to find. I think it's under the community workshop and there's some links to some suggested reading. And that's where the slide deck is. We will update that by, I'm gonna say, you know, like March 10th or so. That's, that's probably our most common question so far. And for the core note too, so that's a really good question, John. Great, thank you. Uh, are you hiring? <laughs> we're, we're looking for a UX person, um, and uh, we would love to have you participate any way you can, but. Um, it, uh, also, we've got some comments about at the Educause uh, Security Professionals Conference. If you haven't registered, rates will be increasing March 10th, so make sure you go, go ahead and do that. Uh, oh, I see, I, this is a good question, the follow-up question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just read it so it's captured in the recording. Uh, this person, the follow-up is, if someone has an application that currently uses the wide area network, uh, could they continue their application to Fabric? The understanding would be that it's not production, but would what, what proved some load for Fabric that other researchers could use for researching resilience, performance, security, et cetera. Yeah, that would be amazing. We, are, we, are, we would love those contributions, absolutely figuring out how to um, do federation, how to get it onto fabric will be a little bit of a, a, an obstacle or a bump, but that, that's exactly, um, exactly the type of thing we're looking for. How about this? Uh, what kinds of special hardware will fabric create? Well, the nodes are gonna be um, special in that they will be a combination of things you can't buy off the shelf. So it'll be a, you know, like a, a combination of um, you know, switching, compute, storage that we're, we're putting together and we're gonna, they will be specially um, made for, for us, for the nodes. Um, so, the, you know, the, they'll be commodity type um, you know, routing, storage, vendors, but put together in, in an interesting way uh, to be lightweight and have some processing. Um, I'm not sure, I don't, They'll have, you know, FPGAs because some people want to do inferencing, GPUs, smart NICs, um, programmable NICs. So in, in that way, I guess it's uh, special because it's not something you can buy off the shelf today. It's a, um, we're putting a bunch of things together in a special design. And those, by the way, people who are putting in some projects um, for various uh, NSF grants, they, some people are uh, writing in, you know, as we finalize what specifically what vendors and what the nodes look like, people are actually writing in, hey, I want to buy a fabric node to put as part of my project or my campus. Um, so that, that's entirely possible too, if, you know, if, if, you're, if you have a project for which you knew, you, you, you know what you want. 
We'll also have some P4 switches in some locations. Thank you. Uh, another question here, is there more that can be said about the partnership with the cloud vendors? So yeah, so one of the things um, that we're still figuring out is uh, chargeback. So I'll, I'll just be honest, you know, connecting is really easy through, a, through the uh, AWS Cloud Connect, through Internet2, they have that whole program. But figuring out um, cloud credits and how to, um, how to uh, like all the sausage making, all the logistics of being able to, how, you know, how much can you use? How is it going to be charged? I'll be honest, we're still figuring that out. But our intent is to go through Internet 2's um, connectivity points there to get to the, th the three big cloud vendors. Okay, why don't we do a last call for questions. And um, while people are typing, I'll just briefly uh, talk about what's coming up. Uh, to view presentations, join in. Uh, join the announcements mailing list or submit requests to present. You can visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. The next webinar is going to be March 23rd at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is end-to-end -end performance and security-driven federated data intensive workflow management. And our speaker is uh, Prasad Kalia. And with that, I think we've got, oh, we've got one more question coming in here. Um, yeah, is that's there, it, yeah, is there potential for seeing fabric nodes beyond the US footprint, for example, at CERN? Right, so the um, NSF, IRNC, the International Networking Solicitation came out recently and, and Area 2 is on test beds. So we are doing a couple things. One, working with some partners who are putting in a proposal who want to put a fabric node elsewhere. And we, um, are, so we're looking at how, how we can do that, absolutely. Um, the challenge, of course, is getting the node to have good uh, connectivity to r &E. So um, having said that, since IRNC is out, the Fabric team is likely gonna put in a um, proposal. So anybody who has any, uh, their sites set an international uh, experimentation and who, who's thinking about it or would like to partner, please get a hold of me so we can talk because we, we feel like doing this internationally is really, really important. Great, thank you. Um, and let's uh, do a last call for questions. But uh, in the meantime, I just wanna say thank you very much, Anita, for presenting this month. And thank you everyone who's, who is following along and asking questions. We really appreciate the interaction. Um, I think that might be, the last of it. So um, uh, I will be uh, cutting this recording, posting it online, and then the slides will also be posted as well. So be on the lookout for that. Please uh, fill out the survey. And let us know what you think. And uh, again, Anita, thanks for uh, presenting. Do you have any final comments? No, this, this goes by really fast. and It's kind of a lot to digest. So please email me with questions or things you thought about. And please, if you have any time to go to the uh, community workshop, please do. We will also be at Global Summit and other events, and you can, you can give us ideas there. Yeah, I'll try to capture some of the links that we were throwing around in the chat and uh, put them in the email when I send the follow-up. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>